Maybe you are at university and thinking about what's coming next, or maybe you've been in a career for 10 years and you're thinking you might want to make the jump into medicine, or maybe you just didn't get the right A-level and have gone to uni and this has always been the plan and you've decided you are going to apply for medicine. If by some miracle the current news about the NHS and the junior doctor strikes and everything in between hasn't put you off the idea of becoming a doctor in the UK at the moment, then welcome to this guide to applying to medicine as a graduate. My name is Lydia and I'm a fourth year medical student at the University at Southampton. Before I studied medicine I did a biology degree and I did a PGCE and trained to be a science teacher before finally getting into the five year undergraduate course at Southampton. I usually make videos all about what it's like being a medical student and give you some insight into life at medical school at the moment in the UK but today I wanted to go back to basics and make a guide all about applying to medical school as a graduate. Now there is a lot to get through so I'm going to get straight into it but before I just wanted to mention that this video is kindly sponsored by Medify. I'm really excited to be partnering with Medify because I actually used them when I was applying to medical school four years ago so it's just really exciting to be working with a brand who helped me get into medical school and I'm going to be telling you a bit about their new software on their website later on in this video so stay tuned to hear more about that. So first things first there are two pathways to consider when looking at applying to medicine as a graduate. There are the graduate entry courses and these are typically four years long instead of the traditional five and you will usually be in a much smaller cohort than an undergraduate course. So for example at Southampton I believe there are about 40 students on the graduate entry course but then later on when you go into your third year you end up fusing with the undergraduate course. So you do the first couple years separately and then you move on to becoming part of the main group of medical students in their fourth or final year and that is typical for most most graduate entry courses. Sometimes you just do first year separately, sometimes you do the first couple years separately, it just depends on where you go. One exception to this is Warwick Medical School. They are purely a graduate medical school only and I believe they have 198 spaces so it's much larger and there are no undergraduate medical students at this university. Now the other pathway to consider studying is the undergraduate course as a graduate and that's what I've ended up doing. So that is where you enrol onto the undergraduate cohort. Um, it's typically a five year course, so it's one year longer, and you will likely be with mostly school leavers who've just sat their A-levels. In my year, there are roughly 20 graduates to 180 undergraduates. However, now I'm in fourth year, the graduate entry course have combined with our year, so there are more graduates within my year group. But to start off with, I was one of a smaller minority in the year who'd come from a degree first. So the route I've taken is typically less attractive to graduates because it is a lot more expensive expensive, it's a bigger financial burden and I have made videos about funding and how I personally have funded undergraduate medicine as a graduate so I will leave a link to that video in the description because it's a topic I'm really passionate about um, because I know that this way into medicine can be quite off-putting for some but I, I do want to spread the word that it is possible even if you don't have funding from parents or family members. But the main reason that graduates tend to opt for the pathway I'm doing is because it is slightly less competitive or quite a bit less competitive than the regular graduate entry courses because of the size of their cohorts tending to be a bit smaller. Now the first step when applying to medicine as a graduate is selecting your universities that you're going to put on your UCAS application form. This is hands down the most important step to get right in your application because you only get four choices on your UCAS form and it's so important that you pick the four options that you're most likely going to get interview offers for. There's quite a lot of things that you need to consider when you are deciding where to apply to but the kind of base level things you absolutely need to be thinking about are your degree classification so have you got a first a 2-1 a 2-2 you also need to be thinking about your degree subject so do you have a BSc do you have an integrated masters do you have a BA because some universities want you to have a science degree and some don't mind if you come from a creative background they'll happily take you with a music undergraduate degree Another really important part of your application is your admissions test score, which we're going to come on to be speaking about later in the video. But the main admissions tests are the UCAT, the BMAT and the GAMSAT. Finally, you should be thinking about how much work experience you've had because some universities are more strict on this than others. 
Other things that are important to consider but not always taken into account by universities are your GCSEs and your A-levels. Some universities still look at your A-levels despite the fact you have a degree, whereas some don't at all. For example, Southampton used to ask for a C in A-level chemistry when I applied, however I've checked, and now they don't even check your chemistry A-level. If you had some good A-levels back in the day, then maybe those are going to help you but if you are like me and don't, I have BCD in my A-levels, it's best to avoid universities that are still gonna be looking for those A's and B's. Also consider whether or not you have a postgraduate degree, do you have a master's, do you have a teaching degree, do you have a PhD? These things are sometimes taken into account, but sometimes you'd be surprised to know that the university doesn't actually add on any points for people with master's or PhD. Finally, another one that some people seem to not think about so much, but where did you actually study your undergraduate degree. Sometimes if you are an alumni of the university, they actually look at your application separately to non-alumni applications. So for example, at Southampton, they rank all of the graduates from Southampton applying to medicine separately from those who are not Southampton graduates. So you have slightly more chance at being offered an interview. So after all that, I guess you can see that figuring out what universities are suitable for you can be quite a lengthy process, but it is absolutely a worthwhile process to give yourself the best chance at getting an interview. My advice for this process would be to start off by looking at the MSc entry requirements website. This is what I use when I was figuring out where to apply and just trawl your way through the website and figure out which universities you are suitable for. You can filter by A-level, degree certification and work experience. So it is quite an easy process but it just takes a little bit of time. And if there's anything you're not sure about or you feel like you fall into a grey area, I would just give the university a ring or an email directly and ask them straight out if you would be uh, an acceptable candidate to apply for their course. Moving on now to step two, which is the admissions test. Now, like I mentioned earlier, there are three different admissions tests to choose from and it's important to consider which ones you're going to sit and whether or not you're going to sit more than one, which I probably wouldn't recommend. So these tests are supposed to test your ability and whether or not you personally have the behavioural attributes that they have deemed kind of necessary for a career in medicine. Depending on what test the university you're applying for is asking for, you may have to sit the UCAP, the BMAP or the GAMSAP. Each university specifies which tests they would like you to sit and you can find out what tests those are on the MSc website or just by going directly to the university application page. Each test is different and I would recommend trying to apply to universities that all ask for the same admissions tests. This being because it takes a lot to prepare for these tests. They're normally sat around the same time of year and I just don't see how you would be able to prepare for more than one. Maybe maybe for a stronger person than me you might be able to uh, but one was enough for me so just make sure that you're trying your best to only apply to universities that ask for the same test. Another important thing to consider is they do cost money so the UCAT is around £75, the BMAT is around £75 and I believe the GAMSAT costs £286 or well, that's at least what they say on their website. Top tip for the UCAT, I know they offer a bursary and I didn't end up paying for my UCAT. If you come from a widening participation background, you can get that money refunded. Check that out on their website just to make sure. So now I'll talk you through the three different types of tests that you might have to sit to get into medical school. The first being the UCAT. Now this is definitely the most popular choice for universities to ask for and is the most widely sat for all medical school admissions. The UCAT is a two hour exam. It is sat in those test centers where you might have had your driving theory test already. The questions are all multiple choice and is split into five parts. Verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning, decision making and the situational judgment test. One thing to note is that some universities take the situational judgment test parts of the exam really seriously, whereas other universities don't consider your situational judgment test score at all. It's worth seeing what score you get in your situational judgment test and then figuring out if that is going to change any of the universities you apply to. Next we have the BMAT, which is another two hour exam with three sections. So I won't spend too much time on this one as it's actually been announced that from 2024 they are withdrawing the BMAT as an admissions test. So if you're looking to apply to one of the seven medical schools that use the BMAT, I would just recommend keeping an eye on their websites to see 
what test they put in its place. And finally, we have the GAMSAT. Now this is mainly used by graduate entry medical school courses, but not exclusively. Part one is reasoning and humanities. Part two is written communication. And part three is reasoning in biological and physical sciences. Now off the top of my head, some of the universities that use GAMSAT are Nottingham, Swansea, St. George's, Liverpool, Cardiff, Exeter, and St. Andrews. So it's quite a big list of universities. I'd also recommend checking out ACE's GAMSAT information booklet because they've made some changes to the GAMSAT this year. One of the big changes is that the exam will now be divided into two separate testing windows. Another key change is that the written communication paper will now be held via remote proctoring. So just make sure to have a look at that document so you're aware of all the changes. I believe registration for the March 2024 window is open now. Now, this is where our sponsor Medify comes in. Medify are the medical school preparation experts and they have asked me to tell you all about their GAMSAT revision tool. Now, I personally sat the UCAT and I used Medify at the time to help me prepare. So I know that they were absolutely brilliant for doing that. So I'm happy to tell you all about their new GAMSAT software for those of you considering applying to universities that require the GAMSAT. So how does Medify work? Well, it is a subscription service you can pay for months monthly, biannual, yearly subscriptions and they provide lots of different things for those of you who are thinking of applying to medicine. One of the tools they now have on their website is a step-by-step -step GAMSAT guide and plenty of practice questions and mock exams for you to use. Within that there are detailed answer explanations, there is progress tracking and performance breakdown where you can get individualized feedback on your scores and how you're doing in your practice. The online course is split into three parts on their website. It is very easy to use. As you can see, the dashboard is laid out really nice and clear now the best place to start will definitely be the GAMSAT tutorial section these are broken down into parts that you can easily go through you can select in any order what you want to go over and what you need explaining each part gives you a detailed breakdown of the section of the exam paper and top tips for exam technique so if you really are struggling and don't know where to begin I would start here then you have the practice section now in this section you can go in select what questions in particular you want to get more practice of perhaps there's an area that you're finding is your weakest or if you're working through practicing methodically and you're literally going through each question type you can make sure you've checked everything off by using this practice questions section and really target your learning then finally you have the mock exam section so this is probably for when you're getting a bit closer to the exam and you want to start timing yourself and improve your pace as it's getting closer to that all-important exam day they have I believe at least five mock exams on there and hopefully will leave you in good stead ready to sit your GAMSAT paper when the time comes. I will leave the link below to Medify's website. Please do go and check it out whether you're sitting the GAMSAT, the UCAT or the BMAT. They have resources on there for everything. Go and have a look for yourself, check them out, see if you think it will be a good fit for you. And thank you again to Medify for sponsoring today's video. Finally, we have step three, the personal statement and your work experience. I've put those two things into one category because I think they kind of go hand in hand because your personal statement is where you're gonna show off any work experience you might have. It's also worth mentioning here that from 2024, UCAS are changing the traditional personal statement to a set of predetermined questions that you need to answer. These questions will essentially form a deconstructed personal statement. So the answers to these questions will likely be the same sort of things you were going to put in your personal statement. Now, if you're a graduate, it's probably not your first rodeo with writing a personal statement or cover letter type thing. Some universities, I've heard don't even read the personal statement. However, some take them very seriously. At my interview for Southampton, they had my personal statement printed out and placed it in front of me at the very beginning of the panel interview and proceeded to go through each paragraph. So in some cases, it really does pay to put effort into your personal statement and make sure that everything you write in there, you can back up and talk about to your heart's content on interview day. Now, this is your chance to really show off any work experience you might have had, any kind of previous career experience you've got and any modules you really enjoyed in your undergraduate degree if you're applying for an undergraduate course as a graduate I do think this is the place where you really can stand out because a lot of your 
fellow applicants are going to be coming straight from school and they won't have some of the life experiences that you've got so really do take the time to show off about those things in this part of the application it is really important to check the work experience requirements for each course so for example i know that warwick medical school have really strict kind of requirements for your work experience i believe you need at least 70 hours of work experience and they need to be from two separate places and it needs to be well documented and proved so you need to have pay slips or references from the places where you did your work experience again i'd refer you back to the msc requirements website to make sure that you're getting those work experience requirements correct and making sure you're applying for the universities that are suitable for you now i wouldn't panic if you don't have too much clinical work experience i only had three days shadowing an a and &E a few years back when I applied for medicine so nothing in the, in the realms of 70 hours when I was applying but it's about really bigging up the experience that you do have and reflecting on that and using it to show that you have demonstrated you've looked into a career in medicine and are aware of what it might entail. Outside of my very limited clinical work experience I made a big kind of song and dance about the fact that I've been teaching and that's because teaching is such an important part of medicine as a career. I also spoke about my favourite modules in my biology degree so I remember talking about maternal physiology and how what happens to the mother in pregnancy is directly linked to outcomes for the child and I went on about that in my personal statement. I even mentioned the leadership skills I picked up in my year as cheerleading captain. Motivating 50 hungover 20 something women on a Sunday morning to do five hours of cheerleading will possibly be one of the hardest leadership gigs I ever have. <laughs> so don't be shy in your personal statement, really sell yourself, big up your experiences and again don't worry if you don't have too much clinical experience just be careful about where you're applying and what kind of experience they're looking for. And that should bring you to your completed application. The next step would be sending off your application and waiting anxiously to hear back about the interviews. If you would like a video on interviews, then do comment below. Hopefully this video has been helpful and I'd absolutely love to hear which medical schools you are thinking about applying for in the comments. Of course, Southampton is gonna be one of your top choices because it is the best. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you very soon for another video. Bye.